In the heart of the night, this world were bright. We would set it light. In the heart of the night, in the heart of the night, this world were bright. We would set it light. In the heart of the night. everyone. I'm Anthropomantic Fiend, and I think I might have gone a little overboard with the eyeliner doodling today. <laughs> Hello everyone. I'm Anthropomantic Fiend, and I do horror-related things on the internet. And before I get into today's review, I want to do a quick thank you to everyone who came and watched my little impromptu hangout and Blood of the Trivids watch along live stream the other Sunday. That was very spur of the moment. I just wanted to do a thing and a decent amount of people showed up for that, including the directors of Blood of the Trivids from Launch Over. They were in the chats answering questions for people and it was a really, really nice surprise after a really long and stressful week. So thank you to them and thank you to everyone who showed up for that stream that really made my evening. But today I'm reviewing Baphomet. It just came out this past month in June. It is written, directed by, producing, and starring Mathen Harris, who also wrote, directed, and starred in The Inflicted, which I've reviewed on my channel. I love that movie. And the short film Sudden Reality. He was also in the horror anthology film German Angst, amongst many other things. Amongst the cast of this film are Danny Filth, who was also in Cradle of Fear, Dominator, and Realm of the Damned, and he is the vocalist for Cradle of Filth, of whom I might be a fan. The reason that my face today looks like I attempted to draw Alice Cooper with my left hand is because I wanted to channel Danny Filth for today's review. The film also stars Giovanni Lombardo Radice, who is in many an old-school Italian horror film, notably Cannibal Ferox, City of the Living Dead, and The Church. He was also in Mavin Harris's film The Inflicted. Charlotte Bjornbach, who is in Cannibal Corpse Killers, a short film called Powerpuff Girls The Long Way Back, which looks like a dark, gritty reimagining of Powerpuff Girls, which is interesting, and Protectress, and Aaron Mary Garrett, who is in Knuckle Bones, the Harrowing, and Dead Don't Die in Dallas. Before I get into the plot, I would also like to thank Mathen Harris, the director. He messaged me and offered me the opportunity to buy a copy of the film signed by him, and it says on here, Martin, enjoy the ride, Mathen Harris. As you're about to find out, I definitely did. Thank you for the really nice Blu-ray of this movie I was probably going to buy anyway. So this film follows a family who live in this rather peaceful kind of small town, maybe country area. And one day they are approached by a young man who goes by the name of Axel Brander who offers them whatever money they want to buy the land that they live on for reasons uh, which he refuses to disclose. The dad and the family is having none of it. He's like, I built this house with my bare hands. I'm not giving up this land. I have worked really hard to set up my family here. Go to hell, basically. Shortly after this rejection, people in his family start suffering these strange accidents and becoming seriously sick or injured or flat out dying. It seems that Axel Brander is part of a cult of devil worshippers who are trying to get onto this land for reasons still unknown and is therefore targeting this entire family. And so the grief-stricken daughter of the family decides that they may as well fight fire with fire and turns to an occult scholar and a witch for help. So the score for this movie was done by Fabio Amuri, whose only other film credit I could find was the anthology that Harris was in, German Angst. His score for this movie is very much your traditional horror film score. It's dissonant 
string sounds of the wazoo, although there are a few passages during the happier parts of the movie where it does open up into this little beautiful melodic thing with some acoustic guitar, but mostly it's all the dissonant string sounds. And it's nothing super distinctive or unique, but it supported the film really well, which is all I really needed. Character-wise, one of the first characters we're introduced to is Giovanni Lombardo Radice as the cult leader. He's lending his wonderful Italian accent to the cult leader. He pronounces Satan as Satan, which I absolutely adore, and he's just flat-out dastardly evil devil worshiper in this great over-the-top way that was really fun, without completely jumping the shark. As for our main family, they are very wholesome, very likable. I find them almost too wholesome in some ways. I would kind of categorize them very similarly to the family that we follow in the first Conjuring film. They're all likable characters, but they're just so wholesome that there's not a lot of uh, kind of personal darkness for the horror surrounding them to latch on to, I guess. I usually prefer my main characters to be a little bit more, I don't want to say three-dimensional because they are fairly three-dimensional characters, they're likable, and they have some nuance to them, but they don't have as much of a dark side to them, which I generally prefer. That's not a detriment to The Conjuring, and it's not a detriment to this movie. I still find all of the main characters to be likable and fun to watch and well acted. Mavin Harris is one of those characters in this movie which was really fun to see because in both Sudden Reality and in The Inflicted he plays a very dark, disturbed, dangerous character. His character in The Inflicted literally gave me nightmares back when I watched it for the first time. So seeing him playing this really wholesome young man in this family was a fun change of pace. In terms of some of the more minor characters that we're introduced to right off the bat, there are virgin sacrifices that appear at the rituals of the devil worshippers. They're literally just these women who are completely naked. They are screaming and begging for their lives and then they get their throats slit. Their blood is poured into this communal bowl, I guess. I'm not sure what you call it exactly, but then they scoop a goblet into it and drink the virgin blood. They are well acted for the very tiny parts that they are. You can really feel their just horror and just agony, but they really just feel like an excuse to put female nudity in the film and don't really add much to the film to me, so I was just kind of like, eh, was that needed? I don't know. I, I don't think so. Getting back to our main cast of characters, though, much like with Mavin Harris's character, when we are introduced to Danny Filth's character here, he is way more wholesome than he has been in literally anything I've seen him in as a character or as himself. I mean, real life Danny seems like a very nice person, but he's a little bit ruder than this character is in a lot of ways. I think Danny talked about this in an interview about the film. He is kind of subverting the expectation of, of what you'd think of Danny Filth as the demonic, creepy frontman of this extreme metal band as kind of being the benevolent occult researcher character. He kind of compared it to Ozzy Osbourne's part in the 80s movie Trick or Treat, but at the same time it really leans into in some ways Danny's fascination with uh, the occult and the dark side and really having thoroughly researched those things in real life so it's also just a match made in heaven or hell for him. I do wish we got a lot more of his character in the film, mostly just because I'm a really big fan of Danny's but for the time that he is on screen, he is very enjoyable. As for Mary Beth, the witch that the family enlists to help them, she is just such a badass. Between having finally started watching the Hatchet films recently and watching this, there are just a lot of uh, badasses named Mary Beth going around right now, and by a lot I mean two, but still. When we are first introduced to her, she is very kind of straightforward and uptight and serious and like you know what you're getting yourself into here right if I do these things for you 
one of which is resurrecting a certain character. I'm not going to say who because I don't want to spoil who dies in this movie, but she's just like, this could go wrong. I hope you know the consequences for doing this stuff. And then later in the film we get to see her be a bit more active and aggressive and minor spoiler alert, but she basically melts the insides of this guy's head and it's kind of amazing. And you expect her to be very kind of serious about it, but in one of the scenes towards the end of the movie she's talking to her boyfriend played by Danny Filth over this video call and she's like, and I think I had like goo and innards pouring out of every single orifice in this guy's head. It was awesome. And it's just like, oh my god, this is one of the good guys. And she's just so proud of herself for having melted the inside of this guy's head. And it's very unexpected, but it's, it's great. I love it. I love her. I also love that when she is resurrecting the aforementioned character who shall remain unnamed, she is wearing little vinyl plasticky gloves. So so she's taken all the precautions. There are a few cops who appear in the film to assist the main characters and they aren't super distinctive but there's one that really stood out to me that I really loved and he's just ridiculously over prepared for everything. When the resurrected character appears and freaks out the policeman he's just like oh my god it could be a zombie should we shoot it in the head and shortly thereafter he has brought dynamite with him because he's just like ah you never know should always be prepared and he's just prepared for like literally everything I would not be surprised if he had steaks and holy water with him in that bag as well and it's very silly but I love it. And then finally towards the end of the film we actually get to see the title character which is Baphomet and it's a very cool makeup, very very traditionally demonic, very bestial, very cool, and just totally unsympathetic towards the main characters and towards the occultists and I loved that. I honestly wish there was a little bit more Baphomet in the film Baphomet, which I will get into in just a minute. Story-wise, I like the premise. The battle over the lands is a just nice simple setup that you can build all kinds of insanity over. It creates a simple conflict of these guys want the lands, this family won't let them have it, how are they going to try to get to it, and how are the family going to try and stop them, and they build all kinds of madness over them starting with, and I do mean starting with, freaking sharks. The first death in this movie besides one of the aforementioned uh, virgin sacrifices is this guy, who shall remain nameless, getting torn apart by sharks. That is where we start, and I I love that. Just just out of the blue, freaking freaking sharks, people. And from there on out, the film really doesn't let up at all. The whole film moves at a really really brisk pace. It clocks in at about an hour ten minutes, which not a lot of films I've seen, especially modern films, clock in at around that time. And sometimes I do wish it would slow down and let us spend more time with the characters because people are really dropping like flies in this movie and these people are grief stricken and part of me wants to spend more time with them in that dark place, but the film does have a little bit more of a fun kind of over-the-top tone and it does spend some time with these characters letting us feel for them and the grief that they're going through, but also manages to balance that with the insane horror sequences pretty decently. There's still a part of me that wishes it would slow down just a little bit more, but I'm actually fairly impressed with how they managed to keep it very fast paced but still really let us feel like we knew these people and get us to care about them. As for the way the witchcraft and the devil worshipy stuff works in this movie, totally fictionalized. The deities that they're referring to, Satan or Satan, Baphomet, and in the case of Mary Beth, I believe Isis and Osiris and the Egyptian pantheon, real things from real religions, but the way they operate in this world is total fantasy, and that is made abundantly clear from the jump 
So in that way, I was totally fine with it. It's not trying to be an accurate depiction of any kind of religion in any way whatsoever. It's not claiming to be based on a true story the way The Conjuring is, which is a lot of my problem with The Conjuring franchise. It is just taking those icons from those mythologies and creating something that is total fun dark fantasy with it and I had a great time watching it. And unlike again things like The Conjuring, I'm gonna keep referring to The Conjuring here, I like that the movie doesn't you know immediately start brandishing the crosses in holy water so to speak. They decide to fight fire with fire and they turn to an occultist and a magic user to fight a cult of dark magic users. I feel like that doesn't happen as often in a lot of horror, especially when there's this devil worship -y cult. Almost every single occasion where that happens, it'll immediately turn to a Van Helsing or an Exorcist or an Ed and Lorraine Warren to bring in their godly artifacts to banish the evil. But no, we get an occultist and a witch in this movie and they solve the problems by melting a guy's head and breaking out some dynamite, and it's amazing. That said, there is a scene where the resurrected character, like, crosses himself and calls on aid to God for help, and it's just like, dude, I know your whole family's probably Christian and everything, and that's fine, but you do know that it was the Egyptian gods who are the reason you're alive again. And going back to the resurrection thing, I was not expecting that to be the as an aspect of the film. I was expecting anyone who dies to stay dead, and I was expecting if a resurrection to happen, it to have the whole pet cemetery type deal going on where if this character comes back, it's gonna go wrong. But it doesn't. It's actually this very unexpectedly sweet little scenario. And as I literally just said, you don't know who's gonna live or who dies. This movie pulls no punches, it moves really fast, characters are dropping like flies, but they could also come back. You just do not know I found that really engaging and really fun. The dialogue can also be really colorful in really fun ways. It's not on Rob Zombie level, but it gets close. And ending-wise, the movie is a little bit anticlimactic. We really barely get any kind of stuff with Baphomet. Baphomet does make a return appearance at the end of the film, but I was really hoping for a even grander final confrontation with Baphomet instead of just the last little sting that we get at the end of the movie. It doesn't hamper the enjoyment of the film in any way, but when it ended I was kind of just like, oh, it's over. Really felt like there was going to be more, and I wish there was. But of course, when one of your biggest complaints about the movie is that you wish there was more of it, I guess that's not necessarily a bad thing, but at the same time the ending just didn't quite work for me. It felt like there was more story there, so uh, Baphomet 2 please. And effects wise in this movie, we've got some really great blood and gore. Most of it's not very over the top, there's just some simple bloodletting scenes, but we do get to see the corpse of the guy who gets ripped apart by the freaking sharks later on in the film, and it's very gnarly. Also there's the guy whose head melts from the inside out, and that is a pretty gnarly effect. There's a tiny bit of digital enhancement going on in places in the film, but pretty much everything is practical and looks really nice. There's, again, some animal stuff, the freaking sharks, and a snake where it feels like there's a little bit of digital going on, some fairly evident stock footage and stuff, but that just added to the fun for me, and given the kind of budget I'm guessing this movie had, they did a fairly good job with all of that. Visually speaking, the camera quality is phenomenal, the cinematography and lighting is pretty beautiful in every scene, and I love the costumes of the cult. Simple and elegant kind of black robes and these occasional like silver devil masks that they'll wear. They're actually very reminiscent of the nameless ghouls from the band Ghost in a lot of ways to me, but a little bit more menacing. And the lair of the cult that we see throughout the movie is a pretty metal set as well. All in all, I can't say this is going to be movie of the year or anything for me, but I was expecting to have fun with this one and that is what I got. 
it has a vibe overall to me of something in between The Conjuring, Rosemary's Baby, and a black metal music video, but a lot more fun-loving than any of those things. So if you are a fan of occult horror who is willing to have a little bit of cheesy fun thrown in there, I think you're going to have a great time with this movie. If you're a fan of Giovanni Lombardo Radice or Danny Filth, I would absolutely watch this just to see them because they're really enjoyable in the movie. And if you're a fan of Madden Harris's other work like me, definitely check this one out. It's a really great time. I believe this one is currently available to rent on a lot of streaming services, namely Amazon Prime, but the DVD and the Blu-ray are also pretty widely available now, so I highly recommend picking that up. That is my review of Baphomet. Thank you for watching my video, and hopefully I will see you in another one. Bye. <laughs>